Glory to the Lord, my dear brethren. Today, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the message from the Word of God has the title Communion of the Body and Blood of Jesus Christ. We will read with the grace of our Lord from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 53 to 57. Then Jesus sent to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, expect you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Who so eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. My dear brethren, the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ is not just a simple liturgy. It is life itself with a man. As the Lord says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Do you see what it says here? Has eternal life, and not that he will have. He has eternal life now. Now, now when? Now, as he eats the flesh and drinks the blood. This means that Lord offers himself to the faithful in an edible and drinkable way. And the faithful accepts this offer and receives it within him. In this case, and only in this case, the faithful has a true relationship with Christ, because only then he has eternal life. If the faithful does not have communion with the body and blood of Christ, then he may think that he has a relationship with God, but in reality has not, because the authenticity of the relationship is not determined by the faithful, but from the Lord with his word. Furthermore, the Lord promises that only he who has communion of the body and blood of Christ will be resurrected on the last day. Therefore, only this kind of faithful will take part in the rapture of the church, which is the first resurrection. It is important for all Christians to know that the body and blood of Christ is not a symbol as some believe. The body and blood of Jesus Christ is a reality via faith. The Lord did not say, take it for this symbolizes my body. But he said, take it, this is my body. The Lord did not say that my body symbolizes food, but said, for my flesh is true food. The whole point of fact is found in this phrase. It is true. It is true via faith. This proves that it is not a symbolic act, but real. My dear brethren, in Christ's church, nothing is symbolic, but everything is done via faith. If the body and blood and the blood of Christ are symbols, then Christ's birth was symbolic. He was symbolically crucified, symbolically resurrected, symbolically you are born again Christian, and symbolically he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then our salvation is also symbolic. But no, we have 
true salvation and not symbolic because the Lord was really born as a human. He was really crucified. He was really crucified on the cross of Golgotha. And he was really resurrected. Glory be to the name of the Lord. We thank him for everything. My dear brethren, now we must look at that exactly what, that what exactly is communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. First of all, it is a gift given to us so that he may dwell within us because he said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Second, the communion of the body and blood of Christ is a denunciation of his death. As Paul says in Corinthians 1, chapter 11 and verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This means that at the time of the Holy Communion, the faithful denunciate the Lord's death, recognizing that they were worthy of death and not Christ. Third, the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ is a remembrance because the Lord says, do this in remembrance of me. This means that the Church of Christ reassembles on Sunday and remembers the wonderful work the Lord has done for the Church. As the people of Israel did pass over in remembrance of the exodus from Egypt, so do, so do the faithful have passed over every Sunday in remembrance of their exodus from the world and sin. Furthermore, it is written, For Christ, our Passover lamp, has been sacrificed. Now, my dear brethren, we must see what is the preparation of every Christian so to have communion of the body and blood of Christ? A necessary condition for someone to have communion of the body and blood of Christ is to be baptized in the water because it is written, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. This means that if someone is not baptized, his sins remain on him and therefore cannot have communion. And furthermore, one must examine himself as it is written. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. This means that before he has communion, he must forgive and not have weakness, weakness, weakness or hatred for anyone and he must not be in permanent sin. The preparation of the faithful is a procedure of prayer and confession. He stands before God with truth, recognizes his mistakes, and condemns them. And then, as he has prayed with his mind, he prays with the Spirit who, via foreign tongues, prays to the Father in heaven, fills the faithful with love, and builds his faith. 
The outcome of this procedure is to distinguish the body of the Lord. If he distinguishes the body of the Lord, then by grace he is worthy to have communion of the body and the blood of Christ. If he takes communion unworthily and unprepared, then, as Paul says, there is the danger of judgment. My dear brethren, there is another matter that we must look at. How is the Holy Communion prepared? In this matter, the Word of God is very, very clear. Let us read from the Gospel of Luke about the way that the Lord himself prepared the Holy Communion and specifically on chapter 22 and uh, verses 19 to 20. I read from inside. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. As we can see from all the above, first we take the bread, then we give thanks and then follow sharing, and then they eat. Exactly the same procedure is followed with the taking of wine. The communion of the body and blood is done separately and not mixed together. We cannot by all means accept changes for practical reasons in the way of taking the Holy Communion that the Lord handed to me, to us. And uh, it is very important to clarify the following. The bread for the Holy Communion must be unleavened. Not leavened, nor crackers, nor biscuits. The opinion that the Lord's bread was leavened is so much historically and theologically completely without base because the Lord did everything according to the law. It's impossible to have done Passover with his own inspiration, nor was it possible his Israeli students and himself during Passover to take leavened bread, whilst the law defined unleavened. If the Lord wanted to make such a change, he would have told us, and then, of course, we would have obeyed. As for the communion of the blood of Christ, we must clarify the following. Many interpretations have been expressed about verse 29 in Matthew chapter in Matthew chapter 29 which mentions fruit of the vine based on this phrase unfortunately various arbitrary views have prevailed in the way the holy communion is prepared either with Jews or with must because these are considered fruit of the vine and not wine, these views are wrong for the following reasons. First, in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 20 to 21, it is mentioned that Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard, he drank of the wine, and become drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Arising from here is that from the fruit of the vine, Noah drank wine, not Jewish, 
And in addition, there is no other biblical reference telling us that the fruit of the vine is something else and uh, that would be what the Lord meant. Also, the view that the fruit of the vine is must does not stand. Must is unfermented wine and it has not been watered. Drinking wine that had not been watered was considered barbaric. Furthermore, we must point out that not using wine as the blood of Christ because of the risk of addiction for former alcoholics highlights the existence of a significant theological issue because it shows that those people claiming this belief do not believe in real that through prayer and thanks the wine is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is only natural for all those who believe that it is a symbol to be worried about this risk. But those who uphold the word of truth know that they are not in danger because they don't drink wine but have communion of the blood of Christ, believing in the word of Christ which says, and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. My dear brethren, the communion of the body and blood of Christ is not done whenever we feel like it, nor as how often we think that we should. The Holy Communion is done on Sunday. As the book of Acts says on chapter 20, Verse 7, the Holy Communion is done on Sunday and every Sunday, not once a month or two, three times a year. The church that the apostles left, the church of the first and second and third century had communion every Sunday. This was the church of martyrs, the church of miracles, the victorious church that came to be 25% of the population of the Roman Empire. It is the victorious model we are asked to adopt and to mimic. We have not been called to follow private interpretations of anyone who thinks that God speaks to him. My dear brethren, may God make us worthy to have communion of the body and blood of Christ every Sunday and according to his written word. May the Lord bless you. Amen.